Well, hello, hello, hello. I'm so super excited. So first off, thank you for joining us. This is the introduction to Meet the Author series, to the Meet the Author series. And I am not your host. I sort of kind of am, maybe a little bit. I'm actually a co-host today. I'm being interviewed. My name is Mrs. Tiffany and I'm the head Imaginarian of Imagerid. And I'm just waiting for Kalila. She uh, had a little snafu with her computer and she's gonna be joining us momentarily. But again, if you're joining us, I thank you. Oh, looks like she's coming back in. She's coming back in. Let's see. Let's see if we can get her. Got a lot of devices going on right now. Yep, there she is. Let's see. Let's. Let's let me add her. I think yeah. that um, there we go. Um, can, can you I'm hear? I'm still having a, a minute issue with my camera. Can you see me? I can. I can hear you too. Oh, wait. Can I hear you? Oh, my goodness. Can you hear me? Technology works. It, it does. Really it does. That's a good thing. Can okay, so me? we are live. We're live. Yeah, and uh, we're ready to rock and roll. I'm just posting here to Instagram, and uh, we're ready to rock and roll. So, how are you? I'm, a, I'm well. I'm still trying to make sure I have my um, life set, and that. Um, I think I'm good to go. I, I think everything, I'm kind of okay. Okay. I'm kind of okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of okay. Here we are. We ready. We see. So here. this is my, I, I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm very excited. This is my very first live. Like I've never done this before. Really? Yes. Yes. So I am really, really excited to be um, here with you today. For those of you who don't know, Kalila is, um, she's the, presently the other half, really more like 75% of Imagery right now. Kalila, like, make sure that I get all my work done. Mrs. Tiffany be off. And she'd be like, wait, we didn't do this. We didn't do this. She, I don't even like to call her an assistant because that's not, I don't think that does any glory. Um, and it doesn't speak to her value. So she's, um, She's she's a part of the Imaginary family, and I just appreciate her. So I just wanted to introduce her. Hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am very excited to be a part of the team. Um, it's easy when you have a passion for what you do. And it, and it really just kind of like flows in literacy and, and children and community service and all of that is kind of like hit home. So it doesn't necessarily feel like work, but at the same time, it is. So Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that because it's important so, to align with those who share your vision. Yeah, right, right, right. I definitely agree. So today is our first segment of Meet the Author. And you it have is. the author that we are featuring today. So I have a couple of questions for you, if that's OK. OK. OK, so let's start with um, let's start with the baby in and of itself. Let's start with Imagine Read. How did that come about? So I know we're going to talk about this. Um, we're going to talk about the inspiration for uh, the book, but I don't know that a lot of people recognize that the book's inspiration and my youngest son, uh, where they converge is how Imagery was born. Mm -hmm. So, so when I found out I was pregnant with Tim, my youngest. You know, my older two children were old enough where that I wasn't in that infancy state with them. And so it was kind of mm -hmm. like I had to learn how to be an infant mom all over again. And that immediately, because I'm so serious about literacy and reading, that immediately took oh, me wow. into the, oh, my gosh, I need to be reading to the baby in, you know, in the womb. And I started going to the library, getting him, you know, picture books so that I could read to him while he was in, in, in the womb. And 
it just brought back all of these memories about how much I love children's literature. And I, uh, I just decided like, I, I really want to write for kids and I want to do this and I want it to be for kids. I want it to be reflective of the children that, you know, I, that are so near and dear to me, not just my own children, but children in my family and my community. And really, that's that's really how Imaginary was born. I just went out on a limb and wrote the book and, and, and it flourished into something amazing that it is uh, now. Uh-oh, looks like we lost Kalila. The internet is is really tricky. I'm sure those of you who are watching, which by the way, thank you for watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The internets are really tricky, especially on live streams. Um, I love the software that we're using because it allows us to be super easy. You don't have to do a whole lot, but still dependent on the internet. So um, we're going to wait for Kalila to come back. But I was just finishing the statement that uh, it's, um, she just texted and said it's frozen. So she's having some issues on her end. I'm going to text her back in a second. The the birth to join to actually to birth imagery had a, had so much to do with the uh, writing and self publishing of its water time mom which was my first children's book that I have here and she has it too um, and it actually is a story of it's a true story of TM um, myself and his father like how much we love and revere water and just so happened I wrote it with uh, stream-based principles, right? Um, encouraging children to not only properly hydrate, but to conserve water as often as possible because it's our responsibility to take care of the earth's resources. So from there, uh, I'd gone to, uh, I'd done an author visit, actually a community author visit. And Someone approached me, the executive director of a very, I don't even know how to position this organization. This organization has a, very, a lot of notoriety in the community and in the educational world. And this was the executive director approaching me asking, you know, have you ever written curriculum? And I was like, actually, I have. I just, I was just contracted to write some curriculum back home in Detroit. And he said, well, I have something that I'm working on and would love for you to assist me in writing the curriculum for it. And I was like, wow, OK. I remember I, I didn't have that vision when I first wrote the book. I just I just wanted to write the book for kids. I wanted to explore, you know, familial and communal bonds. And of course, the the taking care of water and properly hydrating because health and wellness is, is critical to me as well. And I just wanted to encourage families to read together. I thought I was going to sell some books. I had no idea that I was going to be approached to write curriculum. And that's really how Imagery took off into this other direction. Um, from there... I started to, when I started, when we actually wrote the curriculum and um, we started to uh, facilitate it, we ended up going into the school that, oh, Kalila's back, let's see. Okay. okay. All right. I'm not sure what happened with that other than we just have experienced a major technical difficulty. <laughs> It's quite all right, because I just kept talking. I'm like, she's coming back. She's just having internet. So I was in the middle of, you know, how the, the book became the company and how, you know, the company started going in a different direction towards literacy development. Okay. And basically, I just said that um, after I was asked to co-write the curriculum, what, what, what I learned was in facilitating it, I ended up facilitating it at a school that, you know, had children that were refugees and spoke 42 different languages. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really and I have photos that I believe I'm going to post. I think I'm going to blog about this because they were all girls in this in this program. And it was so near and dear to my heart because they were so sweet. And uh, 
I'm such, I'm so sensitive. I was about to tear up there. They were just so sweet. And um, what I learned was, you know, that I'd always approach reading from this very, you know, subjective or this very pragmatic way. Like I know how to read. I love to read. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just bias. It's just cognitive bias that I never really thought, oh my gosh, this is problematic for many. Mm-hmm. Especially those who, you know, um, uh, need language acquisition, like, you know, need to learn English as a second language. Um, this is problematic. So that was my first instance. And then when I started to get out into the community with the partnerships that I had where I could give books away and find out more about reading habits, that's when it really hit me that reading. Oh, thank you, Marie. Thank you, dear. Um, it, it, it hit me that reading is, um, it's not as, it doesn't come to those as easy as it comes to me. And I'm very fortunate, but I wanted to change that. So it started off with Tim, you know, me, me getting pregnant, have, you know, being, having to be a mom all over again, mm-hmm saying to myself, okay, I need to start reading to him while he's in the womb, going to the library, seeing all of the books that hadn't been there just six years previous when Taylor was a baby Mm -hmm. and falling in love with children's literature all over again, because I've always been in love with it, saying, I want to write this book, writing it, self-publishing it. Shout out to Thaddeus Lavallee who illustrated it. Everybody loves the illustrations, probably more so than they love the words, but hey, it is what it is. Here's yes, the- there it is. There it is. And- so that you sent this to my daughter. And we actually have an autographed copy. I don't know if you all really can see that. Um, Miss Tiffany sent this to my daughter, who's now 13. And I think she's had it like maybe three or four years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a while ago. Yeah. I really hope that autograph is worth something one day. I hope she could like chip it. No, like check out on that. Like because um <laughs> Gave it to her and it is an autograph copy. It, it, it was like, okay, you're going to read it and then we're going to put it up and then you can read it again and then we'll put it up. It's not like it stays on our family bookshelf and not on the bookshelf in her room. I don't know hmm. if that's necessarily fair to her, but hey. Well, you got to think because the premise was and still is Imagery being a family literacy platform. I love that because it's, it's, it's read together, right? Right. We, we we all might get something, you know, from it differently, but let's read together. So I love that. It's very well written. It's an easy read. The illustration, just to speak to some of it. Thad did a wonderful job. I mean, as soon as I met Thad, I had been looking for an illustrator. And as soon as I met him, as soon as I saw his work, I knew he was the one. Yeah. It's by. It's- I mean, he made me look so, I mean, just beautiful. I'm like, <laughs> Thad, I don't look like that for real, but okay. I know to be a cartoon character. Yeah. He did a phenomenal job. He did. He did. Phenomenal. So if this is a book that you all are interested in, you can reach out to Miss Tiffany um, and she can get you a copy of it. I think that you and your children or you and your family would definitely enjoy it. We have for years and um, had to pull it off the bookshelf again because I wanted to make sure that we had a copy for the for the show today. Yeah. So totally. Now you have imaginary going is up and functioning. Um, yeah. Uh, from that, you birthed this book. Where, where the, where do you see it going in regards to? Th- let's pull in remote learning a little bit and where we are now with just the whole pandemic and, and that how has um, imagine read and how has, and and I don't want it necessarily to be all about imagine read, but imagine read is really really a big focus or a, a big portion of everything that you do. It and, is. It and, is. In the book, the imaginary <laughs> was on the back. So. It is. I, I love that we're segueing into this because shortly after I wrote and published that one, my next one was this one, which I don't know if you guys can see that. It's called In Kind Reading, a Family Literacy Investment Project. And it's it's a, what I call a working book. And it has activities to um, like on the very first page, you go into, you know, our house. So who are the people that are, you know, um, working in this book? Right. Mm -hmm. You're you're to put a photo of yourself. And the goal with that working book is to create 
strategies for intentional family literacy time, like spending that time together, right? Um, the thing that, that again, when I started, when I moved in the direction from just, okay, writing and publishing books for kids and recognize that I need to tackle illiteracy, um, it just put me in a whole nother mindset, you know? So I wanted to be intentional about the programs and the offerings and the things that I was doing. Totally. It's very, yeah, to Marie's point, it's very important to involve the full family, you know, unifying the full family saying, Hey, you may be literate, you know, separately and, or there may be some illiteracy separately, but when you come together and you share regularly, that is like the one thing that can remedy it all. So I wanted to move in that direction. Like, how can I do this? Because you have to think, Imagine is essentially going on 11 years old. And this was something that, you know, I've been doing this community-based, family-based work. Um, it's actually one of the, how you and I know each other, being a part of an organization where we serve the community, right? Yep. Um, that's always been my thing. So knowing that this was a problem or a challenge that I wanted to tackle, I did the investment project. And then after that, I started doing community-based participatory research. Like I said, that asks, you know, are you reading together? Why or why not? What are your challenges? And a lot of it came back to formal class instruction. It was, well, my son or daughter hates reading. And these are just some, not all. My son or daughter hates reading. They struggle with reading. Um, they just don't want to do it. I can't figure it out. I don't know how to help them. I heard a lot of that. And you have to think over the five years that I did the project, I probably gave away, thanks to Art Arts and Public Hope Press, a University of Houston imprint, um, and um, Wisdom Tales and Lee and Lowe and all of these publishing partners that I have, I gave away like thousands of books. And I would get, you know, I would hear their stories in exchange. And I said, I got to do something about this. How can I get readers reading, but how can I support the family in doing so in ways that they don't feel so overwhelmed and intimidated? And so um, right after that, I went into the classroom and I wanted to test the, my theory of getting readers reading and extending it home in the classroom. Because again, I'm hearing it's a problem in the classroom. My, my, my child's teacher is saying that they, they're not reading, they're not reading at you know, grade level or what have you. And I need to fix it. And I don't know what to do. And I'm overwhelmed. And Or I can't read myself. Right? right. Very heartbreaking. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to start teaching. And thankfully, thanks to uh, the Harris County Department of Education, which is one of the places I was allowed to actually facilitate Imagine Reading today, which I just made an announcement about. Case for Kids, an after-school program, um, in addition to some other um, Brazoria County programs, um, Houston Public Library, some places that allow me to come in and facilitate my program, I was able to prove that the practices that I include work, mm -hmm. like they work. The key is relationship building. You know, uh, those communities that uh, typically suffer, in my own personal and professional opinion, are those communities that are often not included when it comes to resources right. um, and materials. And so again, it was very important for me to continue the legacy of his Watertime mob by reflecting black and brown children, right? Black and brown parents, uh, places in the community, things that are relative. Because that's, a, that's the key. Kids don't wanna read because it's not, it does, what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with my life, right? right. And then parents, uh, making them feel good about whatever their level of education is, that they are, in fact, you know, the first teacher. So fast forward into this pandemic, you know, I did a 21st century la literacy language presentation. And I talked about this in st with Storyplay like years ago. And I, so, I said to people, I said to those teachers then, I said, look, the classroom is going to change. We're behind. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when it changes, if we're not ready, it's going to be it's going to be an uphill battle. Now, I didn't foresee that it would change like this. I didn't know COVID was going to be a thing, but I did know it was going to change. Mm -hmm. And I think about that now and I'm like, whoa, I was spot on. Right. right. Uh, that's that's what's up. That's great. <laughs> but um, being being like thrown into it, I'm looking at how this this gap that was already prevalent 
is widening because of COVID and digital learning. Because right. remember, we're still relationship people. And the thing that keeps a lot of our babies from not being able to read fluently and well is that there hasn't been, they don't have a relationship with the text. They don't have a relationship with the teacher. Absolutely, I agree. Blended learning is ever more important right now. Like we have to do better at creating a really good recipe for teaching and for learning as opposed to saying, as opposed to doing this one size fits all. So um, what's happening now is really is, is where we are. This is the future of education and more so the future of work. Another conversation that I have as a communications consultant that's very near and dear to my heart, especially when you talk about mentorship. This is it. And if we continue to lose our children to digital learning because they're not digitally, they, they don't have the digital literacy skills because they don't have the basic literacy skills, then we haven't seen, we haven't even touched the surface of the problem yet. We're going to see, it's going to be the the haves and the have nots on steroids. And wow. so, yeah, it's, it's, we got to do, we got to do better. But again, that starts with supporting everybody, making this a communal effort, you know, to support kids, their families and the community as a whole. Right. Right. And I think that there with the whole COVID-19 thing and remote learning, there wasn't a transition period. Mm -mm. We went from, okay. And I know just speaking for my children, they, they went to school on a Friday and then we got to know this on Monday. You're, you're not coming back. That's it. And they haven't been back. And that was March of to what March of 2020. And we are approaching March of 2021. So they have a classroom pretty much for a full year. Yeah. So, so with that, you still have um, the parents that you're trying to support because you still have your working parents. Right. The, the children are still expected to um, maintain that same curriculum as if they were in school. And then you also have, you know, some of the parents who aren't necessarily, um, I would say, computer literate. So they're trying to help their children not only learn, you know, and become, um, I guess, kind of like fluid in their in their daily activities for the classroom. They're also trying to help them navigate the whole computer thing. So we really and still function and still do and still get on with their lives a lot of parents still you know they're fortunate enough to to be able to work from home Absolutely. but that still requires you know focus and um th there's still some other variables in there so it's been tough it's it, been really tough it has been and i think that just story play alone which is a very um easy quick read details out some things that parents can do to assist their 21st century learner so it's definitely, um, if you don't have your copy of Story Play, you definitely want to try to get that. And then just um, being active in the community myself, I see some parents who are struggling. And there is a, a literacy issue with, among children, but there's also a literacy issue among adults. Yeah. So if the parents can't, you know, read, how are they supposed to, you know, instruct the children? Support the kids. Yeah. How are they supposed to support the children? Adult illiteracy is something that, again, because we are in amidst of the fourth industrial revolution and because we are in the digital phase. Actually, we 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 were we were going into uh, being smack dab in the digital age and then it was starting to die. Data was telling us that. Right. But then COVID moved us right back into it. And like you said, we had no warning, no shift. I mean, it, it, I mean, well, we had a shift, but it was immediate and it was sudden right and it's problematic for so many reasons from a research and development perspective and again this is a lot to do with my day work but when i look at it as an educator again we start to see the, the wedge is just widening and the first thing that i want to say to parents and, and and because i teach i also teach adult literacy the first thing that i would say to parents Number one, people just confide in me. I guess I have this personality that people feel safe with me, which I'm very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very, I'm grateful for that. Right. Now it can be very painful because sometimes I take on more and it's just heartbreaking, you know, and I have to, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very sensitive about certain things when it comes to access and equity for humanity, especially the communities that I serve. And 
you know, I, a lot of it weighs on me so much that I just have to like, you know, I told my husband, like, I just, I just need to go cry for a little bit, you know, cause it's just so heartbreaking. But the one thing that I tell any adult parent, I don't care how old you are, is I'm not here to judge you because you can't read. I don't care. Right. I care about helping you. Absolutely. So please open your mouth. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm happy to teach you because I love doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I have to consider that that may not have always been their experience, right? They may be judged. They may be mocked. They may have some childhood wounds that they, they're still dealing with. Um, hey, twin. It's critical in that way that we just we feel good about speaking up, saying, hey, I need help. And that's what I found when I went out and I gave the books away because there was an exchange there. And that is building the relationship. I gave the books away. I gave the resources away. Parents willingly told me, well, to be honest with you, I'm dyslexic. Mm -hmm. I don't read. I can't read. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are the challenges. Nobody ever read to me. So it helped me. You know, I know what the data says, but data can sometimes be exclusive. It helped me to create something that I felt as if would still support those parents without them being ashamed. Because shame and guilt are like the two top emotions that'll just, they'll kill you if you let them. Right, right. So, you know, I felt, yeah, okay, you can't read, but how else can you support your child? This is your child, came from your womb, you know, or your seed. You can support your child. I know you may not think that it's, you know, a lot of support, but you can. Even if I have to give you the tools, I'm willing to do that. And so that's where that began. And this is how, you know, we've been talking, having this conversation, you and I, from when you came on, how to move everything that I've done in the class that works, that works for sure, that I've been, you know, praised. I was looking at this tweet from the director um, a while ago, shouting out Imagery, just all of the work I've done, I've been recognized, the awards and everything. It works. And I just need to move it online, but not having time because I work, which is why I have you, thank goodness. Like we have to get it online and we have to create these intimate spaces for children and their parents to show up and say, just come. Right. This is this is it for show. This, this isn't about what you know. Um, right. To um, support you and support your scholars, support your child. So, yes, yes. And I mean, Maurice, con you know, comment relationships are key. They're very key. Mm -hmm. Love how you point that out. I've learned from Imagery the importance of connecting with the youth and not judging, but finding their learning styles. And this is, I talk about this extensively in it, even in the new program, I rewise, I take a snapshot and it's all reading science, if you will. You'll see this term a lot lately because there are learning institutional organizations that, you know, promise you know, do these things and your child will read quick. Or they'll read this way. They'll read that way. And Imagery has never promised any of that because I understand, again, this, this is not a one size fits all. This is a learning and understanding the scholar so that I can teach them something. If I don't know who you are, I can't, how can I teach you anything? Absolutely. Thank this is not for you. This is for me. You know, right. I have to learn from you. So taking a snapshot of their learning style, their reading behavior, the content they're drawn to, there is there is a science to this. And I read wise, it's like, I'm so glad to release it because I do believe that it's going to empower not just school age children, so K through five, but those who are also supporting them through their, their, their um, educational journey mm -hmm. onward to academic integrity, because that is the key to have and sustain academic integrity. So I'm excited about that. But COVID presented us some problems, but nothing we can't, we can't tackle. We've right. been doing this for a while. And then you had um, kind of foretold that or uh, had some of it already pre-planned pre before COVID happened with the magazine. It was just taking it again from whatever paper format you have and then making it into a digital format so that we can have that those resources available for parents and scholars alike. Totally. So, yeah. So totally. when we had the conversation before and you was like, hey, I have this and hey, I have that. I'm like, well, I mean, what did you do? Like close your eyes and say, hey, what's going to happen in 10 years or what's going to happen? in?" Because you're really, really right on point with everything that they need to supplement what they have going on in the classroom. Imagine read is that. 
it's you know what it's crazy it's 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 the gift if you will um i've always been a visionary in that way and it's 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 been both a blessing and a curse because you know when you're a visionary sometimes you see things and again people are like she crazy and i'm like no i'm trying to tell y'all that this is going to happen right um some people do it using science you know i'm a very spiritual person so i feel it you know and again i felt it decades ago and I started just hammering it out. But of course, you know, was trying to make the money because I wanted it to be for community. I really didn't want to go the capitalistic, the traditional capitalistic route, whereas I'm selling you a bunch of stuff that you don't need. I wanted it to be value added. And so, um, you know, just along the ways we had a hurricane, you know, I had some personal issues. I had health issues. It just, it, it seemed like every time I just got a really good footing, something would happen. And so finally, we, you know, ushered us right into last year, which was honestly, you know, not for not for many. And I'm very um, I'm sensitive about this. But last year was really one of the best years I've ever had in, in my life. And it was because everything that I I've been working on and wanted was like here, even though it was tragedy and a pandemic and, you know, we're losing people and families are hurting and, you know, there's a lot of starvation. There's a lot of a lot homelessness, everything taking precedence. I feel really good that those of us who want to solve humanity's toughest challenges are in a position to do so right. because we've we've been able to apply those critical thinking skills and we can see problems from, you know, fast and different layers and facets. And. I just. And I, I, I can't get this stuff out fast enough because a lot of it is, like I said, it's old. It's stuff I've been doing forever. And I know it's going to help somebody, even if it doesn't help the masses. That's not necessarily my goal. Right. Um, if I send it to you, Kalila, and you're like, oh, I know somebody that this can benefit. My job is done. Absolutely. You know, even in the Operation 10,000 Children Imagine Reading that I have, where it's a community drop in, you, your children can drop in. I, we can do, you know, open chat homework help, STEM innovation, whatever it is. I have lessons planned, but it's just an opportunity to just have them check in with someone else, right? That can answer some questions about literacy, digital literacy, STEM, stream, STEAM, you know, and, or just free talk. You know, kids are going through this too right now. You know, right. they right. sick of parents right now too. Like they sick of teachers. You know, we're seeing these videos online where it's like, I saw this one video of the baby, he was just cussing a teacher out and he, she just kept kicking him out and he just kept coming back in. And I'm thinking this is a moment to stop and say, whoa, 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 whoa. How can we get in touch with somebody that's in that household? Who was you there? know, this is, this is a cry for help. This is not acting out, you know? Right. Um, we have to do better about addressing mental health right now. And we have to do better about making sure that those of us who are addressing mental health are also supported for mental health. Right. Um, Cause it's, it can be tough. It can be, and it has been for many of us, you know, um, even with me having the best year, it was still tough, you know? Right. And then um, the uncharted waters is, is something that we've never experienced before. And you can um, take a look back in history and see some of the things that they've done, but it's not what's, need it right now right because if you take a look at some of the uh, if you take a look at history and say okay well there were times where children couldn't go to school or whatever okay well they didn't have the internet they didn't have google classroom they didn't have these other things that still allowed them to be able to participate in a, a in a school setting or on a school platform so we have to be mindful of that and i think that sometimes even as a parent I don't necessarily take into um, consideration that my children are going through this as well. It's like your kids, you got a roof, you got food, you know, what else do you need? Hey, yeah. But yeah, are, you know, I have a, I have a, a little one who um, really would like to have some type of outside connection. Mm. Right. So it's big to them. Kids need social interaction. They do. She needs that. She needs that. So, you know, you have to kind of make sure that even we're still on the same thing with the remote learning and the, the pandemic. You have to make sure that you explain to them and utilize our vocabulary and let them know that this is what's going on now. This is what we're going to do to succeed. And here are the here are the tools that we're going to utilize in order to be able to get that done. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I love that. And when I say social interaction, healthy social interaction right now, interaction that allows them to have an, an, an to have you know some some a place to actually talk, like a safe space. Right. But I do love that you address that because I think even parents are, you know, that's really the biggest thing. It's like, you ain't stressed out. I'm stressed out because I'm right. trying to pay these bills and I got right. the reality of it is everybody is whether you whether you pronounce it or not, the way stress works. And, and this is why mental health to, to Marie's point. It's a necessary discussion because I, I still don't think that we even understand the implication of uh, the absence of mental health care. Prior to COVID, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. prior to COVID, you know, uh, lose somewhat. So we have to be comfortable with having a conversation about mental health and we have to be comfortable with saying, hey, I have a therapist or hey, I need a therapist or hey, I need someone to talk to, you know, even if it is, you know, just like you say, say yourself, a sounding board, someone that's going to give some type of sound um, assist with some sound decision making, whatever that may be. And, but we bear the weight as parents and we don't realize that sometimes that is a heavy weight and then the weight has been i would say um like we've put on more weight with the whole pandemic and then having to home school and, and things of that nature but we have to be comfortable with having a conversation about mental health we do we have to be comfortable with saying, hey, I need help. We tell our children to raise their hand in class when you need some help. Ask the teacher, you know, um, seek additional outside tutoring. We encourage them to do that, but we don't necessarily do that as adults when we need that assistance. And I know that's because, I mean, you know, in the same vein, and I don't want to get really get stuck on this because I can. Neuroscience is also something that, you know, I'm very much invested in. And again, from psychological perspective, um, I prefer Eastern philosophy over Western philosophy, but what what it what it basically says is is okay. Uh, the way you know your neuroplasticity works is um, whether you're aware or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. The brain is a very sophisticated machine, absolutely, and it just does what you what you give it. You know, the only person it knows is you. So a lot of times, you know, we, oh, well, you know, this person did this and this person did this. Yeah, it only knows you and your experiences. So it's going to store up, right, as a machine, as a, as a computing machine, the sum of all these experiences. And so you may not feel like you're stressed, like you said, but mm -hmm. when something of this happens, it quote unquote sparks. And I don't, I use spark and replace for trigger. And I'll tell you why in a second. It sparks the memory that your body should be, you know, in protect mode, like in fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. And over time, if you don't address that, if you don't break that down somewhere and try to sift through it and look at it like, oh, OK, I am feeling like this, like I'm tense, like my shoulders are tense, mm -hmm. my jaw is tense, um, my posture is off, whatever. If you don't take cues from your body because the brain only knows you. Um You'll, you'll be stuck in it. Well, our children don't have, they're, you know, they're, they just got here. We've been here for a while. Right. We so have. they don't have that. <laughs> right. Right. They, they don't have the acumen to say, my shoulders are tense. You know, my back is hurting. Uh, even if they do, you know, they're kids. And this is where it's important for mom and dad and grandma and granddad, uh, caretakers, auntie, uncle, whoever is taking care of the child to say, I'm stressed out. I'm feeling stressed out. And this is why, which allows that child to do some of the same. Um, I've had many people who don't agree with the way I parent because I let my children tell me the truth. Oh. Even if the truth is going to hurt my feelings. Right. I want you to tell me the truth. This is not a, you know, do as I say, not as I do household. This is a do as I say and do as I do. Right. So if I'm not doing it, how can I expect you to do it? There's no integrity and there's no accountability there. So I let them tell me, like, I'm stressed out, too. In fact, mom, you're stressing me out. And I'm like, whoa, am I? You know, I'm stressing you out. I need to chill. Right, right. Um, and so we have to start there. That's the first conversation that we had. And then from there, making sure that we have community. I do understand that therapy is being utilized now more than ever. And I'm very, very happy to hear but I also want us to not get so dependent upon therapy because even if you, you find yourself in a space where therapy could be an option, mm -hmm. 
you have to go on a therapy with wanting to be better and not looking at therapy like a crutch. Right. It's a mindset. Totally. And so this is this is where I, I also encourage, you know, uh, entities and businesses, if you will, that are structured like a imagery that focuses on community to, you know, seek community. Right. Seek community that can really support you with some of these things that you may not necessarily have to have this close knit relationship with, but you can just drop in from time to time. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, that's not always trying to sell you something. That's not always trying to just, you know, seek community and just be transparent. It'll probably make you feel better. Absolutely. Maria saying transparency is important. Absolutely. Allowing the children to be mindful of their feelings. Right. Because so, so often we tell them, you know, you don't feel like that. You don't feel like you're supposed to feel like this. You're supposed to be doing this. I don't have any. I mean, really. And some of that is because that's how we were taught. Absolutely. Our parents said, well, you shouldn't have. You, how are you depressed? You don't have any bills to pay. You have a roof, you have food, you yeah. have clothes, you have all of your um, needs met and most of your wants. Yeah. Yeah. If we, if we don't break that cycle of thinking that the, although they've only been on the, the earth for 10 solar returns or whatever the case may be, they're still human. They're still, they, 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 they're just little people. They still have feelings and they only understand at their level um, or at that the level that they are mentally, but they still need to be validated. This is why instead of us looking at reading as this commodity or as this, you know, uh, academic process, this is why we have to extend it because it's beyond that. So if if I and I say this and I talk about this extensively in the smart learning system, mm -hmm. mindfulness and mindful learning has to be key. What I found in my own research and in developing my programs is I would go into these environments where the children were, and again, I hate this word traumatized, because if you if you look at the definition of the etymology of trauma, it implies that there is a one time occurrence, right? Whereas the trauma that we are describing for some of our communities is has, has been ongoing. Mm -hmm. And so when I go into spaces and I'm trying to teach this baby how to read, the first thing I need you to do is I need your mind, right? I need you to sit still. I know what trauma looks like because I've been around it so much. If you can't sit still and you're fidgeting, um, you're not listening, you're disrupting, that is a trauma response. And so that means that tells me that from a neuroscience perspective that right now your amygdala is like out, your hippocampus probably is there, maybe not. And overall, like the, the development of your frontal cortex is probably not in line, right? Because you have this other stuff. It's just, again, it's a computer. It's just like you're, you're running out of hard drive space, right? Mm -hmm. So here I am trying to teach you how to read and I'm trying to give you more imagery because that's what it is. And you're full. Then it's impossible for me to teach you anything. And so now I'm just your babysitter. And this is something that we have to talk about in the classroom because that's what's happening. And what on top of that happening, we're just passing kids right to the next grade. Yeah. <laughs> and they are functioning illiterate, which eventually they will become adults who are functionally illiterate. Right. We, we, we this is again where, where we have to speak up for ourselves. And if we can't speak up for ourselves, even if your voice shakes, I forget who says that. Um, yes, Hassan, thank you. Yes, lack of frontal lobe development. There are so many the neuroscience and, and, and just what, what we're learning about the brain. That's already been there. It wasn't, it wasn't rocket science to begin. It's like, okay, the brain is really sophisticated. But in this environment, it does these things. In this environment, it does these things. There's going to be a point where it starts to slow down, right? Mm -hmm. And it, once it starts slowing, especially depending on what you're eating, how much exercise you're getting, there's so many variables. It could very well be that you'll never recover it, right? And this is it. when you start looking at Alzheimer's and dementia studies, you'll see it. You'll see, like, this is what happens to the brain. But because we're not at the place where we're, again, saying, hey, speak up 
and or have somebody speak up for you and advocate for you because we don't feel very safe because we don't we're traumatized. Mm -hmm. Right. It's getting worse. And this is where I can't say enough. We need community. Somebody has to some, somebody has to come along and say, yo, I think Kalila is stressed out. What do you think? Yeah, I think she's stressed out. What do you think we can do? You know, um, Oh, Hassan is saying pro progressive education. Education by John Dewey was defined as replacing natural inclination to replace it with habits acquired under external pressure. Pressure. Yeah, when we talk about, and this is why I hate systems, reading systems that you know promise the memorization. A lot of people thrive on that. They're like, oh, if I see it, I see it, I see it, see it, say it, write it, see it, say it, write it, see it, say it, write it, right? If I keep doing that repetition, I'm gonna get it. But again, I can't even put anything in there. If you got a bunch of stuff in there, you know, I can't even put it. It's just like having a full closet, full refrigerator, open the door. All this stuff got to come out. So. And it doesn't. Psychology does not deal with brain development, not from the perspective, especially when we talk about culturally. When you look at some of, you know, some of the journals that are written, I don't want to call out the organizations. <sighs> They're very white. That's the best way I can say it. And the problem with some of the research is that it's exclusive. It doesn't really account for All the people. cultural experience, right? And, and you know, inclusivity. And that could be that could that that stems beyond race and gender, mm -hmm. right? I don't I don't I don't necessarily subscribe to the race ideology. I, I believe that race is for people who want to use it, right? But I do say that there's a such thing as race consciousness. And there is a such thing as um, culture and cultures having a set agreements, language, right? Identity. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this is how they learn. This is, these are in the, exactly, eugenics, exactly. This is how they learn best. And that's not necessarily accounted for when you look at a lot of the journals. And so again, you're giving these journals and this research to these teachers who, and, and other practitioners and administrators who are disseminating and not really accounting for this um, this this brain overload, right? And or the socioeconomic development or lack thereof in the household or in that community. Again, it's it's a problem that, and, and it's it's not new. That's the other thing. I'm talking about it like it's new. It's not new. It's old. COVID I, just like right. I was just gonna say. I think that COVID just kind of brought all of it to light. Yeah. Yeah. People are aware now, like, oh, and they're, they are inclined to talk about it more like, oh, this is a problem. I do have a problem. Um, but it's been a problem. <laughs> it's been a problem. Yeah. Since it's I was in school, since you was in school. Right. We've known um, well beyond the 50s. It was this research that talked about how, you know, we need more. We need more diverse books. So that became this big, you know. Yeah, totally. The bell curve. We saw the, this research. Oh, well, you know, black and brown children need. Um, oh, Ira, and I'm definitely going to talk about the teachers because I, I. But to finish my point, we need more diverse literature. It's like, yeah, that, that study was done in 1951 that well, we've known that for some time. Right. And this goes back to, again, even having culturally adept and culturally responsive materials. Not just the, the children and the parents, but the teachers need to be need to be their professional development has to be rooted and seated in their own cultural beliefs and values as well. If I keep telling you, you got to teach the baby this and it doesn't align with who you are culturally as a teacher. Right. Or your goals and your missions for your for your students. It's You're, a wrap. Yeah, it, it, it's a disconnect because then then what you're teaching, although teaching may be your passion, you don't have a passion for what you're teaching. No, seriously. And, and and I have a close friend who right now is dealing with this and, and my heart goes out to him because he's a he's a young black male teacher and he's like, Tiff, I'm over it. This mm -hmm. is how we're losing, especially our, our, our male teachers. We're losing them because they're like, I don't want to teach no more. I'm checked out mentally. I'm tired of fighting with administration. I'm stressed out. You know, I'm, I, I, I've not only lived this life, but I'm seeing my students suffer and it's killing me. Right. Right. And so, of course, brother, I want you to choose you. But then we leave these children behind. And I'm so glad this is resonating for those of you who are watching, which I appreciate you for staying tuned in for so long, because I know I can go on a tangent. But this is so near and dear to my heart. 
because we're suffering unnecessarily. Right. And all it requires is that we just come together and say, you bring what you have. I bring what I have. Let's do this. Let's, right. let's really support our community. Um, we have to better support our teachers, which is, again, why Imagerate focuses on professional development, why I'm a train the trainer, why teachers, you know, I did the book giveaway. I'm going to do more for teachers, private sessions for teachers. When, when I do these sessions for teachers, when I do them in, in person, I would I would be amazed by the teachers that would come up to me and just be like, wow, can I have your slides? And I'm like, uh, sure, you can have. But I didn't think that it was going to be this big thing. It's just stuff that I've known and taught forever. Mm -hmm. And we do need this. It's not designed to edify our people, which, you know, speaks to this whole industrial complex, right? It's, it's, it's designed for a very specific purpose. And if it's not designed for us per se, then we need to create our own system. You know, we really, really do. And, I, and that can be overwhelming for one person. You know, when I first got to Texas and first day of social work, I signed up, you know, social work to get my degree in social work. I went to go sit with the dean and she said, listen, this is hard work, kiddo. Uh, you might want to save yourself first. And I think back to that. And I'm like, wow, I see what she means. You know, you can't do it by yourself. You can't save the world by yourself. Right. It's impossible. Um, you need you need people. So. So uh, I don't um, a few things that I want to to um, circle back to. One, let's talk about the check ins that you mentioned. I want to make sure that you have um, you give that information out over the broadcast so that in individuals will have the opportunity to write that down and know what's going on with that. So let's talk about the, the check in part. So Operation um, 10,000 Children Imagine Reading was something that, again, I, I wanted to go back to the roots and I've been wanting to go back to my roots, you know, for a long time. It needs to be about community. It needs to be about supporting family. So I schedule uh, a Zoom conversation that's private, that's not recorded with whoever wants to drop in K through five every third Sunday at four o'clock p.m. CST. The invitation is on Eventbrite. I can drop it in the chat and it's just come. We will do free talk. We will do a, a, a STEM lesson and we'll do some digital literacy skill. We'll do some story time. We're just going to, it's just going to be fun. It's not going to be the same boring zoom where you're getting on and you listen to me talk. I love kids. I've said this a lot jokingly, but I'm serious as a heart attack. Like I love kids more than adults. So I let them just do what they want to do. And I'm just there because again, this is about relationships. And if I can tell them, you know, if I can show them consistency and, oh, Miss Tiffany is here. That's all that, that, that was the first way that I would really, really create a relationship with them in the classroom. I'm not coming here to teach you anything. I'm just coming here to be your friend. What's up? You know? And once they started talking to me, they found it was easy and they wanted to do it more often. And, and they would know, okay, she's coming back Tuesday at three o'clock. You know, she's coming back. Like they, Miss Tiffany, when you come back next week, yeah. Are you, gonna, you know, yeah, okay. yeah, they knew it, you know, they look forward to it. And that is what that is the foundation for academic integrity, looking forward to learning. So, again, it's about relationships. That's all Operation 10,000 Imag Children Imagine Reading is. And uh, they really are. I, you know, Hassan, honestly, let me be very honest with you. I would have tapped out a long time ago if it wasn't for the kids, honestly, because being a human right now has been very taxing and very trying. But the children and because they are our future, they will always be worth it. No matter how much I go through, no, much, no matter how much I get beat down, no matter how much I'm tired sometimes, it's the children are worth it. They'll always be worth it. And I would like to believe that, you know, my teachers, my, you know, my elders believe the same thing when I was coming up, when you were coming up. Right. Um, my ancestors even. They had, uh, they kept showing up every day. No, seriously. They had, if, if, if that goes back to a statement that you made um, earlier during the session, you said, if I give you this um, book or whatever, and then you pass it on and it helps one person, then you've done your job. So know that, um, that you, you, though your ancestors and your teachers, they showed up every day because they, they had, you have to have that belief that if I only help one, then I've done my job. Right. You have to, because that one is going to be so inspired and so on fire. Just like, just like he's saying, 
I just put the, the link into the chat for the next drop in, which is next Sunday. Yeah. The, our children are already suffering from broken relationships. And one of the reasons why I didn't like, I mean, I love to teach, but I just, I, it, it was difficult for me to um, break ways because I, the sessions would only be like six to eight weeks. And at, at the, at the four week mark is where I'm just starting to make progress. And now I only have two weeks left and I'll never see you again. So again, it was, it was, this is a short term relationship. That's not enough. And that's what that that's that's when I started saying I got to do this digitally and I need to get these kids digitally ready. Right. In addition to just basic skills ready. Um, but we they need relationships. They're so used to people coming in and out of their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, they need consistency. We need consistency, Absolutely. you know. So if we can get to the place where we say, well, this is here for you. Uh, it's part of the reasons why, you know, we kids just like don't want to deal with adults and adults sometimes don't want to deal with kids because it's like it's too it's too hard to understand the language. But it's really easy if we sit and intently, deeply listen. Mm -hmm. We have to listen to the kids. What are the kids saying? What are they saying? We have to care about it. And that means we have to care about ourselves, which is radical in these days, you know, to care about ourselves. So. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm excited about Operation 10,000 Imagine Readers. It's like I said, it was something I wanted to do because I really want to get I want to get as many children as I possibly can because I don't want it to be where, oh, you're just a 55, you know, people come. No, this is about relationships, about building relationships and everybody having time. Right. Social behavior, social capital is a new buzzword. It's very important. Children need it. They need it and they need um they need to see it. They need to see it. They need to see it in action. They need to they need to be able to model it. They need to be able to show up as they are and be ready to learn. And like I said, be heard. They need that. And so literacy programs that do that is what Imagery is all about. That's what we're about. All day. It's imagery because they're inundated with with imagery. And we got to we got to we got to curve that for our children because they don't know what to believe. Some of us don't know what to believe. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I agree. So <laughs> it's a it's a struggle. It's a struggle some days when you are competing with um TikTok and all these other you know social it's media unbelievable. So these social media platforms to try to yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, I, I'm there with you hundred and ten percent. The other um and I don't know. We said we were going to do right, right about an hour. Yeah, we yeah. are. Yeah, and we are nearing that time frame. So I just wanted to, again, have you talk about the smart learning system. So the smart learning system is one, again, and, and, I, and I did this intentionally, right? I released the smart learning system first. Then I released the Wheel of Imagination second. And here recently, I, I'm releasing uh, I Rewise, which is actually renamed. It used to be called Imaginating Today. The smart learning system just basically implores learners to center mindful learning, right? So everybody has the smart analogy as, you know, smart goals, right? They, they already have the smart, you know, okay, is the goal smart? Is it reasonable? Is it this and is that? And that's nothing what imaginary smart learning system is. Smart learning says, first and foremost, um, it needs to be mindful, it needs to be adaptive, it needs to be reflective, it needs to be thorough, and it needs to be symbiotic. Meaning, please don't depend on Google. If you have no electricity, would you know where to go and get this information in a book? Probably not if you're forever on your phone, right? No. Um, we know from an educational standpoint about the response exchange in there and what happens to the brain over time. Um, but the smart learning system is yet another system that helps them to develop a strategy that works for them. So am I mindful? First of all, do I have an environment that allows me to be mindful? And right now in COVID, you know, this is the, my day job. This is the project manager, communication consultant coming out. We know that home, that affordable housing and, you know, the housing is, is like a big deal. You have so many families who you may have you may be living in affordable housing, which by the technical definition is a thing, but you still may not have space. You, you could be still be living there with 10 people. 
Mm-hmm. So you don't even have space to be mindful, right? You don't have space where you can go and be quiet. Like I have a sign on the door right now. My husband hasn't come in here. My baby hasn't come in here. You know, they haven't come in here. I put a sign on the door though. I had to do that, you know? Right. Um. So it's, am I mindful, right? Meaning, do I feel myself in my body, right? Can I breathe? Can I do some breathing exercises, which I typically always do at the beginning of every session. It's you got to breathe because that's, that's what unlocks the brain and, it, and gets it ready to learn. Can I breathe right now? Do I know how to breathe? Um, is my environment set up like I need it to, albeit quiet, lighting, materials, right? And what is my goal for sitting down and engaging in this, you know, educational experience right now? You know, um, is it, is it, you know, are my results going to be reflective and adaptive and going to be thorough? Do I, will I go out and practice this in a world and be able to glean my experience and take note of that? And have I used all of my tools, both, you know, physical and digital to support this learning process? That's what smart learning is. Um, it does. Home has to be conducive for learning because this is not just a uh, the, the smart learning system was designed to empower little people to do it wherever they are. And that's typically going to be at home. Right. Because in the classroom, you have to do it the teacher's way. Right. Right. Or you have to do it this way to get to the answer. Whereas this, again, is an empowering strategy to help you devise what works for you. And that's really the extent of what Imagery does. It's I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm here to teach you how to think. And if I can give you if I can empower you with some strategy development and you can apply that to your real life, no matter where that is, you know, you could hate reading. But if I can teach you how to apply the strategy. I'm more apt to get you reading and reading well, right? Um, That's smart learning. That's smart learning. Yeah. Uh, In in a nutshell, to practice it, to model it, we would need to do an actual activity, which I'm totally up for doing one, you know, soon. But it's, 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 and I say it's easy. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, it's easy. It's easy to me because I, you know, I've been doing it forever and I've practiced it. Um, and children have practiced it, but it works. It's why am I learning this? What's the value in this for me? You know, um, am I mindful right now? Do I care about what's happening? And what are my tools and resources? All right. How can I explain it? How can I contribute to my community with what I just learned? Now, is that a session that would be like a, a train to trainer session or that would that be like one of the- both how to how to integrate it into your class? So um, Marie and um, Cam, I had I did a session where I gave away a bunch of prizes at the library two years ago. Wait, almost two years ago. Almost two years ago. And we actually did an activity and it was a STEM based activity using the smart learning system. And because we had just had a hurricane here. The activity was I need you to develop. I need you to um, we need to build a boat. Because the last hurricane was really bad. And so it was, we need to build a boat and we need to build it right away. So we need to look and we need to figure out what we have. But they had to do it with the smart learning system. And it was very interesting because first you had to sketch it. Right. So you had to be mindful. And then you had to figure out the materials and supplies you needed. And you had to actually build a prototype. And so using the system again, they started. It was reflective because they saw, oh, well, you know what? That tells me that I'm not always in a position to always learn because maybe I do have resources. Maybe I don't. Right. Who can I go ask for help if Google and these books aren't enough? Right. So it really got them into a space where they started seeing um, that to to employ the system works, the strategy works. But it gave them space to say, okay, I need to fix this, you know, at home, you know, going to school, coming from school in a backpack. Yeah. You have to be necessity, the mother of invention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we, we have to be able to create, I mean, we're naturally innovative people and creative people, but not in, in the, in the, in the a conducive environment. We don't, we just tap out. We tap out. I wanted to address Irie's question. What are your thoughts incorporating catch up programs and initiatives within your goals? Catch up programs can be useful here again, if and only if we're meeting the child where we are. There's a such thing that I, I wholeheartedly believe in. It's called ethics of care. And I'm going to reword this because ethics of care is, is a colonial figure of, of speech. 
is colonized. Um, but ethics, ethics of ethics of care says I have to um, have to meet the student where they are. And in order for me to do that, that means I have to have some experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying experience with poverty, though that could be it. Uh, experience with health challenges, what have you. It's I really have to get to know that child. And it's hard to do that when I have 30 kids, right? Um, I may do it over the year where I know your likes or dislikes or what have you, but your backstory. And I talk about the reason why I use storytelling as the one thing I always teach with is because all stories have prior knowledge. There's a backstory to every story. And most of the time we don't know that backstory. But it behooves us to know that backstory because then we'll understand the story better. So catch up programs, I do, you know, I say can work. It depends on the circumstance and the experience of that child in our family. And then it depends on the time. The thing that we've seen in the cultural stance is you need time and space. You need time and space. Those of us indigenous peoples, we need time and space. We don't operate on this linear deadline thing. Like, oh, your papers are due in three days. We don't, that doesn't work well for us. We're more free and creative people. So we have to have time and space. And typically that's the issue. There's not enough time. So um, again, strategies that empower are best. And that's what, that's what Imaginary is about. And then finally bring in, let's discuss story play a little bit more and make, um, our viewers aware of exactly what that is and how they can obtain a copy if they choose to do so. So Kalila actually did this for me and I'm probably going to look, probably going to bug, bug her to do it for me again to put it up. Story play is something that I really, really felt so good about launching in June, but with COVID spiking like it did. And then one of the vendors that we used, um, and I didn't know this for a long time, some of the materials that we ordered to put into the kits weren't available because of COVID. And I didn't find out until I don't know how long later. So I didn't actually ship the kits. Um, now we have everything we need and we need to go back to it. But story play is of course what it, it says. It says, hey, children do not learn the way we teach them in school, especially when it comes to reading. We teach children, what do we teach them first when we teach them how to read? We teach them the alphabet. Then we teach them sight words and then we teach them sentence structure and grammar. That's not, that's not the way to read. And that's why so many, we're losing so many of our babies. And so story play says through play, your child will read. And it, it, it really, really speaks to all the different ways we read. When I go into a classroom and, and I hear the kids say, I can't read. And I'm like, that's not the truth. You, you, you know, when you woke up this morning, what'd you do? Oh, uh, I, I got up and I brushed my teeth. Yeah. You read a message from your, your brain gave you a message that said, get up and go brush your teeth. That's reading. You're thinking of reading in the traditional sense, in the sense that you're picking up a book and doing this and you can't actually decipher the words, but that's not the only reading. That's not the only reading that your brain does, that your body does. Reading is this big thing that has many layers. So story play says, when we engage a child in active play, fun, their peers there, the environment is safe, they're more apt to love that interaction and in a better position to learn how to read well. And that's where we move over to the story piece and like incorporating the story. Right. Poetry. Absolutely. There has to be an expressing and an expelling. There has to be a, a, an exchange involved and story play seeks to do that. And just because you said it, I think we should like put it back up so people can download the parent guide. I, I'll write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's storytelling in and of itself. I don't know that people really know um, from a mental dexterity point that reading is incredibly calming, you know, and does so much for your mental health. It's why, it, again, it's a blessing and a curse to be who I am because I just want to read and write, you know, because that's, that's my mental health. But I do so much of this because it's getting the information out, writing poetry, absolutely. Writing anything 
we have a, 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 in other words, Wednesday, where it's just, I gave away a bunch of dictionaries and it's every Wednesday I post a word. All you do is remix the word without using the word that the dictionary used. One word, one word a day, one word a day. If anybody knows the story of Maya Angelou, when she stopped speaking, she read the dictionary. And everybody knows Dr. Maya Angelou, is, she's a genius. Absolutely. So when we think about one word, you can write down one word every day that positively transform your processing ability, right? And, and you will better learn how to familiarize yourself with text so that you understand yourself and the world differently. And that's what this is about. It's, it's not just literacy for me. It's very spiritual because the, the line that, that the golden thread that connects reading is the same one that connects human consciousness. And by birthright, we are all afforded an opportunity to be conscious. That's, that's why we're here. And so if you're illiterate, that means you're not conscious and that you're going to struggle. And again, that's hard for me to think that you're not conscious and you don't know what the world is happening around you and you have no idea what's going on. And so it, it one word, writing a word every day, reading a word every day, something, doing something with words, right? It strengthens the mind, like exercise strengthens the body. Absolutely. Humor is so powerful within storytelling that encourages reading and learning enjoyably. Absolutely. Like I laugh so much. Khalil, let me tell you, I saw this post on Instagram. I think I played it like 20 times because it was hilarious and it was his story and he was a bit drunken, but it was hilarious. It's wow. All of the different emotions that we elicit from storytelling, they take us through this range of emotions. That's for our mental health, you know, so story play and everything else that we do really touches upon that. And uh, I'm glad to do it. I'm glad to do it. I'm really excited that so many of you have joined us today. Wow. Thank and then you. Um, two final things. One, the, the meeting or the session or the live for today was really about meet the author. So we kind of, during our session, we talked about imagine, mm -hmm. we talked about the different facets of imaginary story play and um, other words, Wednesday, we talked about it's water time. We did. So one thing we do want to, um, I guess, kind of end our session with is make sure that um, anyone who wants a copy of Story Storyplay will have that available. If you would like a copy of the book, we can make that available for you as well. Um, we will be hosting um, Meet the Author every second Sunday at 4 p.m. CST, which is 5 p.m. EST. If you are author and you would like to be featured, you can contact us at inquiries at imaginary.com. And next month we have someone already scheduled. If you want to talk to we, them. We do. And actually she's joining us, Irie from the UK, a dear friend and partner of ours. Um, she, I, I don't even know where to start talking about Irie. She's phenomenal. She's brilliant. She's developed this. Oh, I'm so glad you love it, Hassan. Thank you for being here. Uh, Marie, um, Irie, uh, Twin, just everybody is just showing up. Thank you. Because you're spending your time with me. You can be doing anything else, but you're spending your time with Kalila and I. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. But, but Irie is like going to be our next guest. Can't you, you can give a little bit about her, but you can't tell everything. Oh, okay. okay. I'm just. I'm just going to tell you, she's genius. And if you love imagery, you're going to love the okay. flitlets. You're going to love it. That's all I want to say. That's it. That's it. You sure? I'm positive. <laughs> um, make sure you follow Imagine on all the social media platforms. We have Instagram and Twitter. Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Facebook. Make sure you um, check out the website. Because there's uh, generally a blog. We blog about whatever is relevant to Imagine Read. And then we also make sure it's relevant to um, what is happening in the world today. The digisphere, yeah. We, we make yeah. sure. Did you have any other final words? We're kind of we're right at an hour and 15 minutes. So I wanna... No, no, we've gone too far. I mean, I, I hate to keep people. Um, 
But we will be doing this, like she said, like Alila said, every second Sunday at four o'clock p.m. CST. Because of the time difference with Irie, she's in the UK. Uh, we probably won't be able to do live with her, so we'll do pre-recorded. Mm -hmm. But you know, people will still be able to like view it, post their questions. But this 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 series come from my you know relationships with a long list of authors who, to be quite frank, honestly, that I have like revered and loved for years and now they're like people that I know and it's like mind blowing like whoa I can just call you up and ask you to you know you know come and talk you know on zoom it's it's mind blowing because again I started this just from a desire like having my son and writing children's books and it's it's grown into this full fledged literacy development company that's really I believe benefiting the community so that's um a big deal so I'm I'm hopeful that people will show up and share again it may not be beneficial to you, but somebody else may need, her, need to hear one thing that you or I have said and they feel good about saying, hey, you know what? I want to I want to support. I want to I want my kid to better read or I want to better read. Right. And I I'm happy to assist. It, it, I think that one. Um, it, it's just a judgment free zone. It is. It very much is. I hate judging. Yeah. It, I, I hate judging so much that when I'm judging, I'm pissed off at myself. Cause I'm judging people who judge and I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute. It's right. a viral spiral. You'll get caught up in it. And before you know it, it's just like, Oh no, it's ego, you know, but it, it can be useful in some, in some instances, the key is observing. Right. And saying, okay, this is what needs to happen right now. Um, but we, we don't judge. We don't do that. We're all human and we're all trying to figure this out for the first time. None of us have done this before and come back to tell the story. So. Absolutely. And then we're trying to bring these little people along and teach them. Girl. But at the same time, <laughs> and make sure that, you know, they're not a flop. <laughs> no, seriously. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it is definitely a lot. And we thank you all for participating with us today. Thank you, thank for your you all. Thank you for your energy. Um, you could have been doing anything else for the last hour and you've been here chatting with us and we're definitely grateful for that. Did you mm -hmm. have words for us? No, I want to thank you for spending your Sunday. Like, you know, this is granted, you know, you get something out of it for sure, but I appreciate you for being available. And I also appreciate your family for being, you know, so respectful. Cause like you said, you've asked everybody to shh. Right. They're all quiet and thank you. Tell the fam I said thank you. Right. I told Tim he couldn't uh play his game. <laughs> So it is definitely one of those my we go back to being mindful about our environment and things like that because normally my household is not this quiet. I mean, even the dog has been respectful. You exactly, have, exactly. So, like park, we we do have a little dog. Come on, come on, doggy. I appreciate you. We need to be mind when we uh, in this session. I'm gonna give him a treat. He's been please. Yes, yes. Please. yes. You know, being respectful and he's been quiet. So I'm make sure I, I give him a treat as well. Absolutely. I appreciate you all. I really, really, I truly do. And I just encourage you, like I said, if it's beneficial and you can share it with someone who needs it, we'll, we will have more blogging. The blog is new. We'll be blogging on a regular basis. Um, all the resources that we have, you know, we don't have anything right now for sale. There will be some membership classes coming, but our goal has always been to support the community. So if we, if you need something, let us know. Absolutely. Well, I think that's the end of our session today. All righty. Well, thank you, my dear. Have a wonderful evening out there, everybody. Thanks for joining. All right. Take care. All righty.